Nobody wave. Oh, look, people <laughs> wave. <laughs> All right, so I'm here for night hacking right. with Joe Armstrong, creator of Erlang, and we're chatting about um, the impending energy crisis. So, well, there's good, there's good news and bad news. Yeah, let's the, start with the bad news. I like the, bad news. The, the, the bad news. The bad news is that the world's IT industry is using 4% of the world's energy, and that, that's growing at 16% per year. That's the bad news. OK, so we're the, we're the problem? Sorry? Yeah, we're the problem. But yeah. we also have the solution, because that's the good news. The, the good news <laughs> is that if we build out uh, a correct computational infrastructure so we can plan transport the distribution of food, we can save 26% of the world's energy. So that's the good news. Okay. The bad news is going to take us 10 years to do that. OK, so in the meantime, there's a, we're going to build a debt at 16% each year, and yes. eventually we'll be able to pay off the debt at a faster rate than we're accumulating. Yes, absolutely. So well, I hope so, yes. Otherwise, we're screwed. Yeah, well, we're technologists. Hopefully, we can yeah, all contribute so, so to solving the problem. So there's lots to do, because we've got to replace all this stuff that's using a lot of energy. Yeah, by so stuff what, is, that what, is, what is the stuff that's using energy? Um, the transport infrastructure, the switches and things like that, things like Wi-Fi routers and everything that's downstream of your computer, and also the, the processors themselves, because they're using lots of energy. So we need these low-power, multi-core processors. So what, speaking of... Um, Computing power. So most of us use like um, you know fat, heavy processors in our computers. Right. And a lot of folks have started using for educational purposes things like you know small risk-based systems like ARM, like the Raspberry right. Pi. Yes. Do you? The Raspberry Pi Foundation just announced a second-generation Raspberry Pi, which is a quad-core ARM seven. Yes. Do you think that style of computing is the way forward? Or no. No, what, I think what, um, what well, is the way forward for uh, well, there's two processors? Things. There's um, the, the massive network on chip architectures. So I'm playing with 64 core machines. Um, I think we'll see 256 core computers this year, probably. And, wow. and then the 1,000 core machines will come along. And they'll run at very low power. The problem is they have very small caches. We don't really understand how to program them. So, so the, the network on chip and the system on chip architectures um, We'll be able to blow like a thousand cores onto a chip. I, I, you know, any year <laughs> now. I, I, yeah, I, keep, so okay. I, I said last year we'll get the thousand core computer on a single chip. Um, didn't happen this year. Almost. I hope it will happen. Almost well, it there. just needs it just needs um, a bit of investment. The designs are there. So when you're trying to write programs for a massively parallel system like that, most most of the languages we use appear heavily serial in the yeah. way we code yeah. today. And even attempts to parallelize things are, um, they're like, it's like Band-Aid solutions on top of systems which are not inherently designed for parallel yes. computing. So how do, you, how do you actually solve that for mainstream software development? Like um, most of us build. Get them all to program in Erlang. That, that, <laughs> that is a good one. Yep. I mean, we're, we're, we're solving completely different program. If, if you program in C, or Java or C++ or something like that, you're looking for concurrency in your programs. Yeah. We're not looking for concurrency in programs. We're, we're looking for sequential bottlenecks in our programs. <laughs> our programs are already parallel. <laughs> so, so then we have to find the, the odd bit that happens to be sequential, and then we can remove it. So, so we have tools to do that. I All mean, right, we've so been doing this game for 35 years, so, so it's... Uh, yeah, so for folks who aren't familiar with Erlang, it's a, it's a functional language. I yes. believe it's used in like a lot of telephone yeah. switches. Yeah, and WhatsApp use it. WhatsApp. Yeah, they built there you it. go. The biggest um, software acquisition ever. No. So, what what sort of other like big systems are built using Erlang? Uh, well, the biggest one in the world is the Ericsson applications. We're controlling about half the world's smartphones in in Erlang. I nice. mean, they, they we're setting up the switching in the networks. So, so, uh, so a lot of the back end, like network yeah, the, infrastructure, yes, telephone infrastructure. Yes. yes, quite a lot of that's written in Erlang. Um, are those areas where you can directly take advantage of massively multiprocessor systems today since yes. it's already built yep, on? We already do. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, so we have a lot of applications, and we, we, we just put them onto big multi-cores, and they just went faster. Well, so, I mean, not. Yeah, OK. So one of the other things I remember I was looking into Erlang back in the day was it, it seemed like it was very good also for, um, for doing incremental updates of Yes. applications. Yes. Like if you look at the way we update a lot of enterprise applications is you like maintenance windows, you take the whole system down. You can't really do that. Well, in I, a it, it, we designed it to run forever. So, <laughs> so, so, so basically you just upgrade code as you're running it. You, you, don't, you don't stop it. I mean, the notion of stopping a distributed system is nonsense. <laughs> I mean, you've got millions of nodes. How do you stop it? You can't stop it and restart it and upgrade it. We just, but it runs forever once you've started. Yeah, so you just, 
modify it while it's running yeah, I, I, and upgrade it while it's... Yeah, I, I sort of ought to be this mad scientist who's invented a system <laughs> that once started runs forever, you know. Then when I die, you know, it'll still be running. Joe started... You know, we... It's like people say, oh, Erlang sl starts slowly. You know, it starts... You know, it takes a second to start, but it's not done for scripting. You know, if you mortarize a second over a trillion years, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, I there's think... There's no stop button. <laughs> it's just a start thing. So when, when you're developing like software and doing um, rollouts of the Erlang code, yes. how, do you, how do you do testing of the system to make sure that oh, you're not... Oh, pretty, pretty conventionally. I mean, we wouldn't roll in new stuff. Well, the whole system is actually designed so, so that if, if, if... It's pretty classical sort of design. You put the new stuff in yeah. as kind of provisional thing. And then if it crashes, you, 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 brought then, back. Then you fall back to the previous version. Okay, and so since it's a highly distributed system anyway, you can test it on yes. multiple nodes before yes. the whole network is yeah, distributed. I mean, uh, when I had a company, Bluetail, we, we, had, we, had, we rolled out things. So in fact, when, when we were up to version 19 of the system, and in fact, to install it, you put in version 1, and you dynamically upgraded it to two, up to version 19, and if it failed, it would just sort of roll back a few versions. <laughs> and, and then you could look at different things in the field and see where they'd been, and then and you just add a few more versions or remove them. It just sort of moves backwards and forwards. It was designed for that. Nice. And that's how it works. So, I mean, I think if you look at where things are going with parallel processing, it's almost as if all of the things which you start out with in Erlang are things which the rest of the programming community are, are finally realizing are real challenges yeah, well, well, and problems. Cloud, I mean, cloud computing is about six years old. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so, no, it's from 2006. I mean, if you look, say, 2006, <laughs> Amazon introduced web services and things, and that was kind of what the introduction of cloud computing was. And then 2004, the multi-cores came. But we've been doing that stuff since about 1985. So, so we had, you know, a 20-year... Yeah. 20 years of additional... 20 years of additional, 20 years of additional, years of additional experience, experience in building a system like it. that. So, in fact, a lot of the problems we see today were actually solved 20 years ago, but nobody knows that. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's reinventing the wheel. And now it's just much more difficult, because there's so many bloody programming languages that you don't know which one to choose. Yeah, no... It, I mean, I'd hate to start programming, because uh, when I started programming, you could choose between Fortran, COBOL, and Assembler, and that was it. Well, I think the, the other thing which has happened is either, even for the existing languages and systems, when you're learning a new language from scratch, there's such a large collection of libraries and a body of knowledge you have to know even to get started. Yes. That it's, it's quite difficult to actually um, fully understand even it, the, it's, the it's, systems yes. you're building on top of. Yes. Um, yes, and of course the libraries make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we no, never I mean, get rid of libraries, they work, we simply add the, to them. Well, the point is they put an abstraction layer there, which if yeah. they work is fine, but quite often they don't work. Exactly. And then you've got to dive into these horrible libraries and figure out how they work. And of course they're badly documented, because the APIs are documented, but not the internals. And, uh, <laughs> so it's often quicker to rewrite the whole bloody thing from scratch than to... to you know, make a one-line change to a library because you've got to spend, got to study the library for a year before you can make that one-line change. And you're guaranteed to break somebody's system, which depends on some particularity yes. or, I mean, or that's, misfeature yes. or and that's, bug. Yes, that's another of the big problems in, in, in computing is, is how, how, how stuff doesn't fit together. I mean, it's just a complete, <laughs> complete mess. I mean, my generation of programmers have created this enormous mess which your generation <laughs> of programmers can, can sort out. So we've, we've created a vast amount of employment for you people. Yeah, so I should go so and retire, leaving this total mess which you can fix up. So thank you very much for <laughs> <laughs> creating jobs. providing job security for the IT industry yes. through perpetuity. Well, it's not just me. I mean, yeah, well. all my generation <laughs> fucked up in a sort of big way by doing all this stuff that you people can fix up. So congratulations. Well, I, I, but I think you also produced a body of knowledge in languages which hasn't, if you look at most of the modern language changes, it all relies upon looking at like older systems like um, ML and Haskell if, and if, Erlang if and it, adopting if it, if ideas. If it did, it would be good. But <laughs> no, but I mean, if you look at things like Node.js, you know, which has just forgotten how to do time sharing. Yeah. Run to yeah. completion semantics vanished in 1965 and then was fortunately <laughs> a dormant for a long time and, <laughs> and then re-emerged in Node.js. Kind of, and then they'll invent time sharing again. Oh, goodness, you don't need to run to completion. You, you, you can suspend. <laughs> oh, dear, what? Perish the thought. What do, you, what do you think about some of the, the features being added to the Java language, like functional um, programming styles I, and lambdas? Not, I'm and 
you haven't? I don't follow Java at all. No, I mean, not Church, Church invented the Lambda calculus in 1930, <laughs> so, so, you know, 70, 85 years before Java adopted it. It's not, not very good. That's, that's, that's about the pace Java picks things yeah, up. Yeah, so 85 years later, yeah. they adopt a good idea. That's, <laughs> that's um, not rapid progress, I think. Yeah, yeah, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. You know, perhaps they'll put lift, lift comprehensions in in another 100 years or something. Though. Yeah, so most of the folks are back in sessions. But um, before we wrap up, does anyone here who is listening in have a question for Joe about the, the future, the very, well, I guess it's a bright future if you look at it from well, what I we can so. do. But it, cause potentially, I mean, we've got uh, this, we, the, the world's got enormous environmental problems. And it would be naive to think we can solve them with naive methods. We, we need a sophisticated technology to feed all the people on the planet. Yeah, yeah. And, and to make use of the resources we've got. And, and, and you know, we're not going to... Computers are here to stay. They're not, they're not going to go away. We're, we're doing this massive experiment with computers at the moment, which nobody oh, yeah, knows so the we, outcome we chatting, of. We were chatting about this earlier, about um, how a lot of technologies are being... Exposed to children and yes, um, yes. I mean, all, all these attention-grabbing devices, Twitter and Tweet and things, are, yeah. are changing our span of attention. So, getting kids who can't learn in school. Actually, there's a the big problem that, that parents who have smartphones are not interacting with their children properly, not talking to them. So, so the children are becoming stupider. Does that delay like speech? Yes. Reduce yes, IQ. Yes, yeah. A parent who's always kind of looking at their smartphone while they're pushing their baby walker <laughs> and not interacting with the child is actually damaging the, the child's brain at a very early age. And we're doing things to children's brains that we don't understand. Yeah, so one of the things our preschool teacher for my younger daughter, who's three now, told us is that um, maybe we shouldn't be letting her play with an iPad all day. Mm. Um, no, you shouldn't, no. Which might be stunting her ability but to because, actually interact with got, people in the real world. You've got different part, you've got different parts of the brain that do deep learning and shallow learning. And, and this is the shallow learning part of the brain is stimulated by, by one set of things, but it doesn't go into the deep learning part of the brain. And that, that needs quiet and, and, and a, you know. So all these attention grabbing devices, so, so I guess, they're, they're I guess very what bad you're, for you. I guess what you're saying is that- Yeah, turn solve, off tweet, no, turn no, no, off no, your tweets. To solve the environmental problems of the future, we have one generation chance, because after this, it's all downhill. If we don't our kids solve can't, them, our kids can't do it because we're corrupting them. No, no, that's not all kids. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly. I mean, I'm there must be a few joking. who turn off their, <laughs> turn off their, their Twitter feeds or something, or don't, don't go to Facebook all the time. Well, or something you, like that. you turn it off so you don't get distracted while you're playing Minecraft. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. cool. Well, thanks very much for the interview, Joe. Okay. It's been, it's been a lot of fun, and we'll have another interview coming up in about an hour on the next break. Okay. Thank you.